Uh, I am delighted to introduce our second keynote speaker of the day and that is uh, Jayashree Ulal. She is President and CEO of Arista Networks. So I guess, I mean she is pretty well known, you know about her anyway, so I thought I will only share some highlights that I know, okay. So maybe this you can learn from her bio as well, 5 plus uh, VP titles at Cisco over the period of 15 years, she built pretty large part of Cisco's business, okay, over the years. And as you know, Cisco is a pretty dominant player in the networking and internet industry, so that's a big deal. Uh, she ran over $10 billion of business for Cisco, again, a big deal. Uh, the three areas, so you know, few people that have gone across these areas, networking, storage, and security, and she has worked and led businesses in all of these three areas. So I think this is still something you can learn from uh, the, uh, her bio. But one thing that I thought I should share with you is that over the years that I have interacted with people and people around her, this is the reputation she carries, that she is the fearless leader, she drives hard and she tries to get what she wants to do. So I am always curious to know what is the next thing she is trying to get, okay, so that I know where she is going to be headed. Finally, I stumbled upon something which was even more interesting, uh, uh, more interesting than anything else. Uh, I came across a YouTube video where she is performing a very popular Hindi song, a duet song and to my surprise she did it pretty well uh, and so I was very impressed with that. So without any further ado, uh, this is Jai Shri. I can definitely tell you I think I speak better than I sing. So. Uh, uh, I hope that video, too bad video, YouTube pro, pro, proliferates everything, but it's my pleasure to be here, Guru, and thank you for having me. And it's also a great honor to follow um, uh, a great speaker and somebody who's really been involved in the internet for so many decades. When I say I've been here three decades, I often feel like a veteran, but it's good to see that Vince talked about 40 years in networking, and that tells you how much has happened and how, uh, how much. While things change, things also have pattern matching and things remain the same. The most common question I'm asked about software-defined networking is, you know, do you believe in it? And does this mean uh, software is eating hardware? That's uh, often frequently asked question. And, and my answer to that, I guess, is through all the time that I've been involved in networking, I don't know about you all, but software has always been a key part of networking, but software has to run on something. It doesn't run on air. So I hope you all leave away from these presentations knowing that software-defined networking is definitely changing the way we all live, learn, play, and work. But at the same time, I think it's enabling a lot of different applications in a lot of different markets. And when I shared with Guru that uh, you know, we were going to do a keynote here, one of the most important things today for me to learn from you and also to speak to you about is not only about software-defined networking, but some of the use cases and applications we're all seeing and how it's really moving from definition to hype to some of the realities. Um, but maybe first a little bit about Arista. Um, I, I don't know how many of you know, it's a young company. Um, I, I've been with it now over four years. And um, uh, much of our reputation came from really leading the charge and leading the market in low latency networking. But what's happened is we too have uh, built different kinds of clouds. Clouds like SDN is a, is a term that needs definition. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a real bottleneck and real need to move away from traditional and legacy enterprises to solving specific high performance transactions, whether it's low latency, big data, cloud or web 2.0, and increasingly virtualized networks as well. So Arista in Greek means to be the best, and we're striving to be the best both in technology, in our team, and in our delivery for different applications. But what I didn't realize myself is that Arista, when we developed and we really are crown jewel and the heart of what we did for the last eight or nine years was our founders based in Stanford um, uh, really developed a modern networking software called EOS, Extensible OS. And while we were not clairvoyant enough to call this software-defined networking, today we realize that a lot of the attributes that you hear about software-defined networking is in fact EOS. And we've been building this kind of software without that kind of name for the last eight, nine years. And at the heart of it, I guess you'll hear a lot of terms on what SDN means. Um, the very popular view is that it's a separation of the data plane from the control plane and it requires a controller. And then there are views often where you hear of it as one technology, OpenFlow or the NICERA acquisition or network virtualization. 
But here at Arista, we have a very pragmatic view, which is it's got to really have two important attributes, be open and be programmable. And at the heart of what our software operating system really developed was to, in fact, focus on these two things and build that cloud scale uh, type of network with openness and programmability in mind. And we've been doing that now, and we've been deploying at the rate of one new customer a day, and uh, we're up to 1,900 customers, and have, in fact, deployed a million ports of Arista um, switching. It was very fitting for me to follow Vince because, in fact, the inspiration for Arista was Google. Google in 2004 actually published a spec that said, we want just three attributes in a good network. And the three attributes were, give us a non-blocking network, no oversubscription, no you know, bottlenecks, no, low latency. Give us one, at that time it was at one gigabit, that was the most predominant speed, today that would have probably been 10 gigabits, and build it for us across 100,000 nodes. Oddly enough, not a single vendor, including um, my uh, former company, could meet all of those three specifications. You could do an AND, or you could do an OR, but you couldn't do an AND. And that was, a, that, that was both troubling for Arista and puzzling that how is it this, this type of scale of network can't be built? Well, the reality is the applications didn't quite drive you there and you didn't need it. But today, much more of the applications, and there are many, many more web 2.0, high performance compute, high dense virtualization, big data that is driving you there. And so our inspiration was how do we build a network that can scale anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 um, uh, nodes or 10,000 servers? How do we make it fully non blocking, completely uncompromised, non oversubscribed? How do we build something that at that time was one gigabit but can actually scale to 10, 40, and 100 gigabits and maybe terabits over time? And how do you do this keeping in mind that the world is no more just physical but in fact virtual where every physical server can in fact be multiple hundreds and thousands of virtual machines and the ability to connect and provide workload mobility across virtual, physical, and cloud is now a necessary mandate. And so I would, say, I would tell to you the, the fact that software-defined networking is here is really driven by the fact that we are in the third generation of networking. We, we went from the mainframe era. I, I actually started in that era where I built um, memory chips for Cray and CDC in the, in the semi, semiconductor Silicon Valley world. And, and then from there, the world moved a lot to distributed traffic patterns and networking with client server. And today, I would tell you with Web 2.0 and more server to server interconnects, you're really seeing a new type of workload mobility, a new type of network, not only high performance driven, but driven increasingly with the agility required in applications to make them respond better to your network itself. And so the cloud to me is, is although an amorphous term, I think there really are different types of clouds. Most often we attribute this to the public clouds, whether it's the Googles or Amazons or Microsofts. But increasingly what you're seeing in the enterprise is more and more private clouds, whether it's a low latency uh, 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 tick cloud or a big data storage cloud or a hybrid cloud that could be a combination of the public access to your enterprise um, or uh, increasingly uh, web 2.0 or wireless type of environments as well. And so all of these new applications are driving these new cloud networks and driving a new type of network architecture. When I used to try and explain networking to my family and to my parents, and, uh, and they'd say, what do you really do? And I'd say, well, I, I do this thing called Ethernet, and I do TCP IP and XNS, and they'd go, what's that? And finally, I realized that uh, the, probably the biggest indication of what we do in networking was actually the stock price of, of our networking companies. When I was in Vegas, and these two ladies came up to me and they said, can we take a photo with you, your stock? Cisco has made us rich, and we'd like to take a photo. And I said, okay, that's the ultimate commercial definition of success. But really, a lot of what networking got started with was Ethernet and how do you connect point A to point B. Vince talked about the ARPANET, and then following the ARPANET, the role of TCP, IP, and Ethernet was really to bring connections to all of the prolifer uh, proliferating computers and devices out there. The next phase of networking, characterized largely by, the, I would say, the 2000 decade, was not only how do you connect devices, but how do you interconnect and build the internet. And, and you all know that Cisco and Juniper and a number of companies were born from that. I would submit to you that all of you here are in the middle of the third wave here where SDN is all about building that programmable foundation with open APIs that not only allow the interconnection of networks, but enable key applications. 
Applications and network have always been ships in the night, where they kind of are aware of each other, but don't really have to know about each other. But increasingly, this is becoming important. And the agile response of applications to the network and how programmably you can define each aspect of it is becoming key. Now, everybody uses the word programmable, but here at Arista, and especially as it, come, as it um, um, pertains to SDN, I think you have to define this off a clean sheet of paper. It's difficult to sprinkle pixie dust and say I'm just programmable on an existing piece of network. You have to have fundamentally thought of the architecture from day one, and we built this off a clean sheet of paper using a publish and subscribe model, using in-memory distributed data systems where we can have a state-oriented database that can deal with the thousands of millions of agents so that each agent and the interaction with the database is well understood. You don't have that in the enterprise today. Today, if you have to install a network and then an upgrade, you have to schedule an enterprise window of maintenance to actually make that possible. Whereas in the new world of SDN, if you actually build a software architecture that can keep the awareness of each state so that as you in install a new piece of software, you don't have to bring the whole network down and actually schedule a maintenance, but you can automatically recognize that state and, and associate it with um, the new upgrade, then you automatically have um, self-healing upgrades. If, a, if an agent fails, you can bring in a new copy of one, and you have fault containment, fault re repair, and a type of programmability where you're always having a state of awareness between the applications and the network itself. But programmability doesn't stop there. It really has to happen at every level. You have to build it into the kernel by having an open kernel. You have to build it into your programmatic interfaces, both northbound and southbound. You have to have to work with different types of technologies, whether it's uh, VMware virtualization stack or uh, simultaneous to this conference, there's an open stack conference going on in um, Oregon. So work with that OBS switches and the quantum plugins or the new Grizzly enablements over there. Um, and then also offer the right extensions to different applications, whether it's to a security environment or to an application delivery environment or a big data environment. So, the, this is a, this, much like the OSI stack, is a systematic problem that needs to be solved at every layer. And that's what Arista is really set out to do. It's also about recognizing that our applications are changing. In the past, we, we really talked about the importance of an operating system. And today, how often do we talk about Solaris or HPUX? Or, or, right? and the world has moved and converged to some very standard, well-defined operating systems. And, and Linux is at the heart of it. This is an open source movement. This, even so storage and servers as we know it as physical devices are increasingly moving to virtual machines. And the importance is really less about the physical ports, but in fact the workload mobility across them, whether it's virtual mach machines or virtual storage devices. These are pools of physical machines or virtual machines that you have to address. And the applications are getting modern. Uh, you're not talking just about enterprise legacy applications. You're talking much more about visualization, media, free, high-frequency trading, um, you know, uh, things that are big data that are really driving the transactions and interacting much, much more, which is why the software and the programmability of it becomes so important. So I would submit to you that the new software-defined data center is increasingly about your network, responding to these applications, dealing with workload mobility, and also dealing with the big data pools that you have to any, anywhere, anytime, any workload mobility. So there are five forces that have directed our SDN strategy, and I'd like to share them with you because I think these are important for all of you. And at the heart of it to us is really building and making sure first you have the right foundation. For those of you who remember networking and for many, many years, including my times, the classic enterprise networking was always a three-tier model, access, aggregation, core. And a lot of bottlenecks happened between these three tiers. And if you had a bottleneck, you built another tier. The tiers just kept adding, and you added more cables, more optics, more oversubscription. I think one of the most fundamental shifts in the cloud and the importance of performance and the if impact of software-defined networking has been the flat topology, whether it's at layer two or layer three. We don't have to innovate or invent new protocols or, or proprietary standards. Using good old-fashioned layer two, layer three, ECMP, active-active uh, links, today you can build a very flat topology of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 nodes. But I think what software-defined networking can do is go beyond that. First, you have to have that important foundation. That leaf-spine network is vital for you to build the right things on top of it. 
But equally important is then to have the right programmability hooks on top of it. One example of a hook could be the, uh, the, the, the importance of making it more and more operational. Imagine that you have all these nodes, but and there are hundreds of thousands of terabits of capacity, but how do you get one view and one single vision of it? One view can't be one ribbon cable running across all of them, but has to, in fact, be a logical view. The ability to have the right APIs to give you that view it becomes very, very important. That one view has to actually be a logical view as opposed to a pure physical view. So I would say to you, even though in the textbooks we learned about layers one, two, three, all the way up to seven, that there's actually a new stack emerging. And the new stack pertains more to the practical way we're all deploying networks, which is to bring the best of breed network foundation, layer on, that, on top of that the best of breed compute, best of breed hypervisors, best of breed storage, and best of breed SDN controllers, whether the control plane is in a network or abstracted as a separate server, these are important devices to actually control and provide dynamic orchestration and provisioning of the entire stack. And finally, the applications themselves that you may be delivering or deploying to make this happen. This new cloud stack is, in fact, the heart of the SDN movement. And I think why so many of the vendors and so many different types of vendors are, are needed to bring it together. There's also a fallacy that if you do SDN, then you mustn't be a legacy networking vendor, or if you're a legacy networking vendor, you mustn't do SDN. And I think here, too, there's an important way to be pragmatic about this. If you look at a traditional IP networking view, the strength of it is it's a very proven architecture. It's been working for 30 years. Yes, we all have our issues with it, but the scale and the, the manageability and the familiarity cannot be underestimated. But it has some fundamental weaknesses, especially in the control plane where often the data plane is much, much fatter, fatter and faster than the control plane can keep up with. And this is where the overlay controllers and the definition of SDN, whether it's with OpenFlow or OpenStack or different types of technologies came in, which is, can we take the internet scale, but also provide a more flexible control plane and, and potentially even a single point of control plane or a redundant control plane if you have a high availability mode. But I think the ideal SDN solution and the more practical one uh, unless you have a completely greenfield situation, is where you can blend the best of both. A hybrid network is never going to be about ripping out all your TCP IP and putting in one magic controller, nor is it going to be a putting in one controller and ignoring all of the IP. And I think the best way is to blend the SDN controller and the IP and have a set it and forget it mode where you can automate and really provide the flexible control and programmability. And this new model, I think, is what's being really perpetuated by uh, the ONS and, and a number of companies to make the best of these two worlds survive. So at SDN to me means different terms, and you know, as I said to you before, there's the, there's the purest view, there's the common view, then there's the practical view, and then there's how do you really provide controller-friendly environments to multiple programming models. OpenFlow um, uh, 1.0 and subsequent is a very important piece of especially um, some of the use cases I'll share with you later, where you're not just looking at it purely from a how do I make the internet better, but how do you really address specific use cases? And one of the most common ones we've seen is data tap steering and tap aggregation. There's so much unstructured and structured data running around, you can't make sense of this, particularly at 10, 10 40, and 100 uh, gigabits. You have terabits of data. How do you really do the traffic mani manipulation? And how do you really do the traffic analysis, the aggregation, the packet capture, the real-time requirements? And to, and really set apart, if you will, the, the good data from the less needed data. Uh, OpenStack is a natural alternative to some of the well-installed and heavily dominated VMware environments where you can have an open virtual switch working with a controller. And OpenStack's not only defined the networking piece, but has defined the compute and storage piece just as well, so you can build a nice cloud stack with that. I consider VMware a very important um, contributor to SDN and to the and it's probably the most widely deployed control in the marketplace today with vSphere and vCloud Director and vCenter. Hard to ignore, and particularly with the NYSERA uh, um, acquisition and with some of the new protocols emerging with VXLAN that give you tremendous scale and change your boundaries from standard layer two to L2 over L3 tunnels. I think you've got a really uh, new type of SDN network emerging. 
And finally, the application delivery vendors. We talk a lot about the network itself, but how do you connect and scale firewalls? How do you scale application delivery devices? How do you scale storage devices? This becomes an important piece of the interface as well. So being open to important different types of environments for different types of applications is a very fundamental part of SDN. But I'd like to shift gears and say we've talked a lot about the technology and some of the market trends, but how are these things really being used? So I thought I'd share with you these are examples among Arista customers of how we have seen practical use cases of SDN. And um, for, due to lack of permission and for sake of their confidentiality, I've kept their names. But the first example is a very major online cloud provider. And their biggest issue in how to deploy SDN is not just the capex of installing gear, but the operational savings. As you all know, increasingly in this world of maintaining large networks, you, know, you either outsource your network to someone else, or you make your technology work for you. And the OPEX is turning out to be much, much more of a driver in terms of your cost for every million dollars of gear you put, put in. You could spend five to 10x in maintaining it. And God forbid you have a, um, a network outage, you know, that every five minutes of a network outage can be several thousand dollars as well. So the, the, this was a case of a switch or router rollout that in the past took them two or three days. With the enablement of Rista EOS and some of our programmability techniques, they were able to bring that down to 30 seconds. They used some of our zero-touch provisioning and orchestration, and things that in the data center often took hours was now down to minutes. They had typically assigned two or three engineers dedicated to it. With our scenario, they could have one engineer, not just on this, but across the entire program. And the number of errors or the number of wrongs was reduced from 10 or 20 percent down to zero. So the change velocity, the bill of wrongs, the overall improvement in operational savings using some of the risk technologies just allowed them to bring down the operational costs. So as their online provider resources were scaling, their OPEX was actually reducing. Another example is a major social networks provider, and it, you know, this isn't, comes as no surprise that we're all on social media today. And we're all probably on it today as we speak. And the bandwidth consumption and the number of amount of traffic and this company is ri running already the entire network at 10 gigabits. And they're having to overhaul their topology. They're having to look at IPv4 addressing, how to move to v6. And a layer two topology alone is not going to cut it. They're actually moving to a leaf spine and spine of, uh, spine of spines architecture because they need such scale. At the same time, as they're scaling their network, their technicians are not scaling. Their, their resources to manage their 15,000 servers remains the same. And so again, this is another example of putting technology to work, where they were able to not only cut down their um, provisioning time, but they were able to use some of our programmatic APIs to work with their applications and enable some very large BGP ECMP networks, and also use a lot of our Python scripting to program their own custom uh, environments. The third example is using OpenFlow. And OpenFlow, as I said, uh, while the heart of it started as the research projects and a lot of ONS uh, work began with OpenFlow, uh, we see some now tremendous application and use cases for OpenFlow, both in controller mode, on, but also in switch mode, where you can be used as a data tap aggregator. As you all may know, in many cases, data tap aggregation is a separate application. It's an out-of-band application, different than the actual switching of packets, but it doesn't have to be. You can enable an open flow agent right on the switch and manage through a controller, whether it's a flood light or big switch or NEC or any kind of controller, and therefore get that kind of steering and out-of-band control and management and traffic monitoring um, separate while your t data packets are still moving. Um, and we'll, we'll show you later a little bit more of a demo on this that'll give you an idea. But the idea is not only can you use OpenFlow, but you can use OpenFlow semantics to do direct flow programming as well. So the, the, the fact that you have an IP network and you build OpenFlow don't have to be mutually exclusive. In a lot of these elephant type of flows, server to server traffic, you may have your primary path you know, distributing between your spine switches and sending traffic for whether it's HTTP or mail or video. And at the same time, you may have a backup path where you set up very specific flows and manage those flows for your, for, for your backup traffic. So this type of direct, specific flow-based programming, still using OpenFlow semantics, is also a very exciting extension of SDN as a use case. 
Another very important use case is just the southbound and northbound APIs themselves. As you start to build a cloud network, you realize that the racks and racks and racks of compute servers, often connected with a leaf or top of rack switch, and then connected into a spine switch, can be single points of failure, or even in an active-active topology, you could bring down an entire server down if you don't have the right hashing and the right meaningful uh, visibility to each of these. So having both northbound and southbound APIs so that you can have that visibility and also connect into your favorite management and orchestration tools, often you're not going to rewrite them, but you may already have them, means you have to have either something as simple as CLI commands or maybe more object-oriented and machine-friendly APIs to, to interface into your favorite uh, instrumentation. A fifth practical example is network virtualization. We all know we've been hit with the server virtualization wave. Today, it is estimated that over 50% of our workloads are, are virtualized in the physical server environment. Now, that has a huge consequence to the network as well. That means your software-defined network, which today is running as a separate virtual island, your virtual network and your uh, virtual servers are running entirely separately today. So the ability to really marry them and enable workload across your virtual, physical, and cloud becomes important. This is why I'm really bullish about a technology that um, many vendors in the industry co-invented together, VXLAN, Virtual Extensible LAN, because all of a sudden the boundary of a layer two just got expanded from you know, a bound problem of 10,000 or 16,000 VLANs, and the unit of VLAN has been challenged to something that's much more L2 over L3, and now you can scale it to 16 million nodes. And so, so your network virtualization, if you will, can expand to keep up with the millions of um, so virtual servers that you're deploying as well. So what, what VMware has brought to server virtualization, SDN can bring to network virtualization, whether it's in a VMware environment or in a, or in a open stack environment, and VXLAN is a critical protocol to enable that kind of L2 over L3 live migration across virtual, physical, and cloud boundaries. And this is a very exciting use case that's emerging as well. Another example, and last but not least, that we see a lot of is cloud elasticity. How often do you run into an environment where your network guy is telling the application folks, hey, you're running too slow. And then the application folks is telling the network folks, you're running too slow, and the finger pointing continues, right? And there's really never been any interaction between the network and the application to let you know before the fact what's going on. And by having the right hooks where you can send congestion alerts or actually let the application know that you're, you know, you could set watermarks so that you can say here's a high or a medium or low threshold, you can capture the affected traffic or you can proactively deal with the affected traffic in a particular pod before it happens. Um, we call this latency analyzer at Arista, and the ability to work with application vendors and application delivery vendors so that we can move the traffic or deal with the trouble spots, or actually gain visibility on the trouble spots long before it happens is another example of cloud and SDN elasticity. I could go on the whole session. Thankfully, Guru has limited me to 30 minutes, so that, that'll keep this short and sweet. But I guess I'd leave you with the fact that what a lot of what we're seeing is not just the hype of SDN, which undoubtedly is there, but increasingly the reality of SDN. And to me, it's all about customers. Humans don't obey Moore's law. Scaling out of Hadoop clusters is a reality. Cloud providers are driving the kind of scale I never saw two years ago. Web 2.0 is defining a highly distributed data center. The common thread across all of this is you can save operational costs. My favorite quote was a customer who told me he had budgeted three weeks to install our gear, and, um, and all of a sudden he was done in three hours. You build the right software, you define it correctly, you plan correctly, your work is a heck of a lot simpler than just point pot boxes and products. And this is what's very exciting about the movement and, and what we're all gathered here to do. And I guess for those of us who like history, and some of you probably don't even identify with these protocols, but one of the earliest um, companies I worked for, um, my old boss said, Jayshree, forget about uh, TCP IP. Let's just go from XNS to OSI. Imagine if we'd done that. I wouldn't be here to talk to you for the last 10, 20 years. But uh, if you look at the last 10, 20 years, there was a lot of chaos and confusion on protocols. And it was XNS, DECnet, LAT, uh, OSI, TCP IP. And then the world consolidated to one IP network. And I think you're going to see a lot of confusion in, in the SDN world on the definition of SDN. 
but the world will consolidate to new workload mobility and a new cloud network where applications drive your use cases. And you saw me share some of these application use cases. And much like the confusion on what's the right protocol eventually figured itself out, the, the, the confusion on what's the right SDN application will also figure itself out. So I thought I'd conclude before I invite you and actually show you a demo uh, on what does SDN mean to you. If we had time, I'd ask each and every one of you, but I'd sh I thought I'd share with you some of the common definitions I've heard as I walk around both within my customers and my employees and my friends here. So one definition, Stanford defined networking. Oh, certainly there's a, there's a lot of roots there, and hats off to you all. And uh, keep it up and keep it going. And I'm sure there's a lot more education universities who would chime in there, but so the, I think that's fair. This is my definition. I think for the first time, we have made networking cool again. Five years ago, it was all about social media and Facebook and Zynga and Farmville, and I don't even know these, some of these things. I've never used them. But I think for the first time, we're seeing a tremendous amount of innovation and investment and uh, come into uh, the industry, and uh, I like that. I uh, welcome it. Some often associated with one technology, and uh, many of us are guilty and charged with that, and that's one definition. Um, this is my favorite. Oh, yeah, I'm building an SDN chip. I thought SDN was software, but I guess the, you could have a programmable silicon and call that silicon-defined networking, too. And then there are many who think they still don't know what it is. But I hope I was able to share some aspect of it, and I think this forum is a great one. Uh, we'd like to add a little bit more to making sure you still know what we uh, think SDN is. And for that, I'd like to invite uh, my friend and colleague from many years at Cisco, now with me at Arista, Tom Black, our Vice President of SDN Engineering. Tom? So we're going to do a little demo here, right? And um, the last time we did it, the wireless connection didn't work, but you'll take care of that by making sure. Uh, yes. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Can you hear me out there? Great. If you could, uh, if you could uh, queue up the video. This is a video made of a demo we're actually doing over in our booth, but we didn't want to trust competing with everyone's iPhones and uh, have something go awry. So uh, we'll get the video up in just a moment from the team in the back. Uh, but what we'll be looking at here is uh, basically a standard kind of leaf spine design. You see the three nodes on the left side of the, of the, the slide there. You've got a video server, 10.10.10.10, talking to a video client, 40.40.40.40. .40 .40 .40. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to use both our direct flow capabilities as well as integrating one of our switches doing tap aggregation into a floodlight open flow controller and kind of take you through this whole thing. You're going to see CLI here, not helicopters and skydiving. I apologize. Okay, so uh, what we've got right now is we've, we see the traffic moving between the video server and the video client. And what we're going to do here is we're going to show, just take a look at the, the routing table. And what you'll see, that the three switches on the left here are actually being managed in a standard layer three control plane fashion. This is actually OSPF running. And uh, we've got connectivity now over to the video server. Now we're going to look at that one of those leaf layer switches here that's kind of blinking, if you can see that, and look at our open flow table. And you're going to see it's empty. Now this is where direct flow comes in. Rather than bind, say, that whole switch or that port or a whole VLAN in open flow mode, we're actually going to let people manipulate OpenFlow right on top of a Layer 3 network. And you can see here, just to keep me honest, you can see Ethernet port 11. It's really not sending any traffic out from that leaf layer to the TAP cluster. All right. So let's go ahead and configure OpenFlow. We drop in. We're going to set up a, uh, a match policy. Uh, what we'd like to do here is we'd like to match on all traffic coming from the video server. And we're going to go ahead and mirror it out that port Ethernet 11. All right, egress mirror, and I guarantee because this is a video, the demo is going to work. Okay. <laughs> Exit. Now we need, to, uh, we need to go look at things here. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the open flow table and see what we've got. We should find one policy in there. Things will go right. And what you can see is a match on the video server, and, and let's go ahead and mirror the traffic out towards the tap cluster. OK, with that in mind, uh, what we'll want to do here is make sure we've, um, we've actually got traffic flowing uh, over the TAP cluster. So we'll take one more look at the counters. And now you can see Ethernet 11, uh, excuse me, Ethernet 1 there, which is the connection from the leaf to the, uh, uh, the TAP, is just railing away. OK, so moving over to the TAP switch, we're going to take a look at uh, what open flow capabilities uh, have been configured so far. And you can see we're connected to a floodlight controller there at that 172 address. Now, the next thing we'll do is we'll take a look and make sure that the current open flow table is empty. Our goal here is on that tap switch 
to use floodlight to program an entry so that the actual video will go over to the monitoring tool on the far right. This is to say we're, we're snooping on someone who's watching the video, 40.40 here is going to have a bad day. Um, looking at the counters on the tap switch, we should see that there's actually nothing uh, uh, coming in there on Ethernet 1. It's uh, an Ethernet 11. It looks like it's pretty quiet, which is good. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and configure that open flow policy in, uh, in Floodlight. So in order to do that, we're just going to send a post a, 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 an HTTP message to it. And you can see we're going to use a, say, hey, look, look for that source IP address, 10.10.10, and go ahead and output that to port 11. And you see we get back a successful status entry. Good. All right, so let's go back to the tap switch and make sure that it's got the open flow policy and you can see, yes, Floodlight did program EOS. We're in good shape. Now, you also see the video has been transmitted, the monitoring tool it's represented by the, uh, that terrible picture in the upper right corner of the screen. <laughs> um, and you can see if we check the counters there, uh, port 11 is, is just blasting away traffic. That's the video, again, in the upper right corner of the screen being, being sent along. All right, so what you've seen here today is our open flow technology at work, both connected to a controller and then programmed directly into the switch right over the top of a standard layer three network. Thanks. It's exciting, thank you. And so, <laughs> it, I, I hope this leaves you with the fact that SDN is no more theory. Yes, there's a lot of hype, yes, there's a lot of definition, but there's some real demonstrable technology in Africa. And we at Arista and, and, uh, and along with ONS are very, very excited to be here and honored to be part of what I think is a movement to more openness and programmability. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess uh, we are running a little bit behind time, so but I would still want to allow a couple of questions, but let's keep the questions and answers short. Uh, so any questions for Jayashree and Tom? How come the audience is so quiet today? I'm so kind of surprised. There's a mic right there. So do you foresee industry having multiple SDNs and uh, gateways between them rather than a single, perhaps a fabric of a single SDN? Uh, I think it depends, again, on your definition of SDN. If, if you look at SDN as a VXLAN gateway, yes, I, I foresee that you could have a hardware-tapped VXLAN and you'd gateway into the physical world so you can go across virtual and physical switches. If you look at v, uh, SDN as an open flow implementation, we just showed you a native way. You don't have to have a gateway at all. You can implement it right on the switch and then talk to a, have a controller mode or a controllerless mode. So, you know, again, assuming you have a specific problem to solve with SDN, it can have a gateway or not. That's the way to look at it. Okay, one last question and then we'll move on. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I have a, a, a strange question for you. It's a bit philosophical. <laughs> uh, what, uh, coming back to the main thing, okay, what is SDN, the, uh, the abstract entity? We see the concretes as open flow. VXLAN and the Microsoft uh, implementation, what's it called, uh, something. <coughs> Hyper-V, yeah. Yeah, uh, so there the, are the three things. But what is the overlying definition that connects all these technologies together? So the question is, what really is SDN? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll give my three-word three definition, and, if, and there's obviously much more behind everyone. Should be open should have a programmable network foundation, and should have a strong separation of data plane programmability and control plane programmability. Those would, that would be my definition. Uh, you you asked to keep it short, so that's what it is. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, and